Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Excellent. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, as we're just waiting to see if anyone else shows up, I'm going to start by introducing everything here. Uh, this is a program from the Deerfield Public Library titled The Lyric Self, Discovering Queer Traditions in Poetry, a lecture and Q&A with Lisa Hyten, poet, teacher, editor, filmmaker, and my co-director on Queer Poem A Day. This is the capstone program for our Queer Poem A Day series, our new this year and unique daily poetry podcast for Pride Month featuring poems written and read by contemporary LGBTQIA plus poets. I want to thank all of you who have engaged with and supported Queer Poem A Day. A special thank you to the friends of the Deerfield Public Library who helped fund this series. And the response has really been phenomenal. So thank you all. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend that you check out our Queer Poem A Day website, deerfieldlibrary.org slash queer poem a day. I'll put the link in the chat once I'm done with my introduction. Uh, there you can find the text of all of our poems and recordings. You can also find the Deerfield Public Library podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. The poems and recordings will all remain on our website as a collection, an archive, online, and in our stacks. I know Lisa and I do hope to do this next year. So if you'll permit me a slightly longer introduction, since I am the co-director of Queer Poem A Day, um, to introduce myself, I'm Dylan Zavagno. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library. And one of the things I do is host the Deerfield Public Library podcasts. For over four years, I've produced monthly interviews with authors, artists, and other notable people from our suburb of Deerfield, from Chicagoland, and all around the world. The underlying thesis of the podcast has always been that the world of culture and the arts are right where you are. They're on the shelves in your library, they're in the program rooms in your library, or they're in your headphones. As our mission statement has it, we provide open access to the world of information and ideas. And a library can really be a place to introduce you, to uh, model for you the ways that people engage with history, the arts, uh, highlight, present, teach. We are a public trust here, a hyper-local archive and it's really about discovering what you can do from this place, a place that maybe you thought was boring or felt yourself unconnected to the community, to literature, to history, to art, to nature. My hope is that we collect all of that and connect what might seem separate or difficult and give a vision for community and maybe cohesion. From this place, and actually from the place I'm sitting in right now, I've talked to many best-selling authors of all genres, academics, uh, the best-selling comic book author of all time, a James Beard award-winning pastry chef, sitting member of Congress, uh, a 95-year-old photographer once said to me, and then Hemingway said to me, or told us about when James Baldwin came to Deerfield, Illinois. I've talked to romance novelists, historians, some of Chicago's top film and music critics, the New Yorker's poetry critic, and a young adult novelist from Singapore, among many others. Still, I never would have imagined that we'd be publishing original poems by some of our greatest living poets, poets I've read and idolized for years who have shaped my life. I am still pinching myself that two days ago we published an original brand new Eileen Miles poem. We've also featured in Queer Poem A Day, younger poets, Chicagoland poets, award winners, emerging voices. Lisa and I invited 30 poets from the LGBTQIA community to share a poem and an audio recording of that poem. We had no assignment. We didn't want to overdetermine what a queer poem is, but let the poets and poems speak for themselves. What we found was so many strange coincidences, through lines of images and themes, which I think you'll hear a bit about tonight. And we also did a lot of editorial work thinking through the order to present the poems in, how they played off each other. And overall, we hope this provides a snapshot of queer poetry today, but also in its order and presentation, an essay 
about the different modes and voices that make up poetry, that make up queerness, and how they support and challenge each other. You'll also hear about tonight the larger context and history of poetry from queer perspectives and the experience of a poet and reader approaching these works. So now I introduce Lisa Hyten, who like me is from Deerfield, Illinois. Lisa is a poet, teacher, and filmmaker. Her first book of poems, After Feast, was selected by Mary Jo Bang to win the Dorset Prize at Tupelo Press, which comes out this October. I know we'll be doing a podcast interview and I hope some other events. Lisa holds an MFA in poetry from Boston University, a master's in education in arts and education from Harvard University. She's the author of the chapbook Variation on Testimony, also just announced a forthcoming chapbook, The Clearing in Spring 2022 from Black Lawrence Press. Lisa is the senior poetry editor for the Adroit Journal, and she is the founder and co-director of Queer Poem a Day at the Deerfield Public Library. If you're interested in more of how Lisa and I met and began this collaboration, we can maybe save that, save that for the Q&A, which we will have after Lisa's talk. I will just say that working with Lisa has been an absolute pleasure, an enriching, enlightening experience to be discussing poems in a common language. Of course, that common language is being fans, readers, scholars, teachers of poetry, and queer poetry in particular, but also a common language born out of experiences we didn't know we'd already shared. Like our experience in our beloved English teacher's classroom, Jeff Berger White's classroom at Deerfield High School, we were a couple years apart, or hours spent in the stacks of the Deerfield Public Library, or just two people in the sometimes desperate predicaments and the static joys of growing up queer in this time and place, the late 20th and early 21st century in a Chicago suburb. Lisa is a brilliant writer and thinker, and it's really my great pleasure and honor to present our final event of Queer Poem a Day, the lyric self discovering queer traditions in poetry. Thanks, Dylan. Um, I'm hoping that you can share screen on the slide so we can kind of get started. I just, before I start, I wanna just say thank you to Dylan and to the library in my wildest dreams and I think in Dylan's, the idea that this would exist at all, let alone at a little public library, let alone the one where we grew up uh, is an element of a paradigm shift. It's not that there's not more work to be done, but it is, uh, it brings me great reverence and joy to know that this has been possible in our lifetimes. Uh, so I wrote a little something called The Lyric Self, I think and hope that you will all learn about why it is that queer poets in particular have ears and spirits most in tune with Eros because of the kinds of predicaments and things that we deal with in our lives after you hear this talk. The Lyric Self. I first encountered Sappho through Anne Carson's translations of If Not Winter. I was on the island of Thassos. I was turning 25, turning pages, and turning into something else altogether, a lesbian, my edges salted in Aegean. The fragment, You Burn Me, sits alone on a page, those three words clanging like a gong against the blackness of the white page. I read Sappho, I wrote fragments and poems, and I could not stop thinking of other poems and poets, the lines ringing in me as that gong on a page. You do not have to be good. When I go into the garden, there she is. The specter holds up her arms to show that her hands are eaten off. She is silent because of the agony. She is silent because of the agony. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. I remember. The elements when you leave home are dislocating, especially in a place like Thassos, where it seems no time has passed. Olive trees, goat paths, the clanging of bells, 
grapevines, marble. On the island, time slows and memory and imagination have what's necessary to arise. It is the central condition of nostos, the pain of remembering. Lines flooded me, yes, but the memory I had, that pang of nostos, was more feeling than it was image or narrative. I remembered desire, though I'd had no real lovers, at least not ones recognizable to others or even myself. And yet this feeling persisted somewhere between death and love, both things I could not have possibly remembered. Once more into my arid days like dew, like wind from an oasis, or the sound of cold sweet water bubbling underground, a treacherous messenger, the thought of you comes to destroy me. How is it that these longings could befall the body when my quintessential predicaments in life had been identified by absence? In Eros the Bittersweet, Anne Carson begins her rendering of Eros, sexual love or desire, by translating this fragment of Sappho's. Eros, once again, limb loosener, whirls me sweet bitter, impossible to fight off, creature stealing up. Carson begins, it was Sappho who first called Eros bittersweet. More precisely, the translation is sweet bitter. Carson shows us that the chronology is not important, that Eros being first sweet, then bitter in narrative is not the function of the description. Rather, her poem begins with a dramatic localization of the erotic situation in time and fixes the erotic action in the present indicative tense. She is not recording the history of a love affair, but the instant of desire. One moment staggers under pressure of Eros, one mental state splits. Being world sweet bitter isn't descriptive, it's metaphysical. The speaker has been rapidly twirled into a state of confusion. Though little is known about Sappho's life, the fragments we've been left with have led our contemporary culture, even down to the rhetoric, to credit her with our visions of love between women, sapphic love. Sappho's own sexuality aside, the speakers of the fragments and the Greek choir, we can imagine reading them aloud to the lyre, experience Eros as all powerful. Quote, Eros moves or creeps upon its victim from somewhere outside the speaker. Desire then is neither inhabitant nor ally of the desirer. Foreign to her will, it forces itself irresistibly upon her from without. Eros is an enemy. Its bitterness must be the taste of enmity. That would be hate. Carson's characterization of Eros and desire in this context can be directly applied to our contemporary understanding of queer life and queer poetry. Two quintessential subjects of lyric poetry are love and the self. The idea that desire could be foreign or even an enemy of the desire is metaphysical and artistic representation of internalized pain or even homophobia in the homosexual or queer body. In reflection, Cyril Wong's poem, which we presented this month, The Men We Loved, gives us this predicament in all of its sweet bitter nostos. The men we loved. The men we loved, the men we had, the men we wanted. They pass us in the streets. They're going to the gym, to the park, to the pub, to invisible rooms on the internet. They cast their lines of hunger for other men now. The men we wanted, who wanted nothing to do with us. The men we hid our names from and crept away. They are disappearing into their work, into the rest of their lives, picking up their phones to answer another man's voice and putting them down again. The men we had now plow the ache of other men. Time flips them over each other and abrades them to the bone. These men who taught us to be bridges on the way to somewhere else, something better. The men we loved who wiped the disappointment from our lips with a thumb, a tongue down a throat, a promise to call again and the promise fulfilled. Long before the accident, the illness, the overseas job, a touch turned cold, the averted vision, the other man. The men we loved, the men we had, the men we wanted. They have done far worse than fail to miss us, 
they have forgotten us. Each is slinking into a cab with another guy and does not wave goodbye. These men who once taught us of ourselves crane to hear the call of new lives now, the call that is always waiting to be answered, a boy crying wolf, or maybe the truth this time. This truth we leave our better selves for only to find them again when we least expect it, a face rising like a moon in the night's long window, a night we are scaling with our hearts in our mouths. Then when we reach the top of the stairs, what luck, the moon has become a mirror. Part of the haunt in Sappho's understanding of Eros lies in the idea that we can't control who we desire. It creeps upon us. In contemporary queer poetry, poets take this feeling farther into pain by considering the role of fate and how Eros or desire are capable of whirling mere mortals. In Frank Bedart's poem, Guilty of Dust, the speaker presents us with the fatedness of love up or down from the infinite center, brimming at the winking rim of time. The voice in my head said, love is the distance between you and what you love. What you love is your fate. Then I saw the parade of my loves, those performers, comics, actors, singers, forgetful of my very self, so often I desired to die to myself to live in them, then my parents, my friends, the drained specters once filled with my baffled infatuations, love and guilt and fury and sweetness for whom male spirit yearning to the earth. Then the voice in my head said, whether you love what you love or live in divided ceaseless revolt against it, what you love is your fate. Though these lines can be assumed by any reader in a universal fashion, the threat of homosexual and queer love create the gravitas in the poem stakes. Fate can doom you to that which is forbidden. This isn't ideological like taking an apple in the Garden of Eden, but manifest in flesh and blood when the bodies of lovers are queer and when some accept their fate and others spend their lives denying it. As Sappho tells us, Eros is a limb loosener. It shows us that the boundaries of the body are far more flexible than we allow. And as for the power of Eros, the god of love, he who melts limbs, quote, proceeds to break the lover as would a foe on the battlefield, end quote. How is a speaker to weather these conditions and powers? Saffer, Sappho offers us the following fragment. I don't know what I should do, two states of mind in me. Then later, I'm in love, I'm not in love, I'm crazy, I'm not crazy. The speaker is whirled into acting and not acting on the desire that has confounded them. The desire is not in the beloved, but instead in the speaker herself both states of mind at once in one vessel. The hidden figure below all of the arrows, the element that causes such pain and grief is shame. Some boundary or contract has been broken when we long for what is either absent or forbidden to us, especially in queer longing, be it for the bodies of others or what we desire and hope for within the bounds of our own figure. If Eros can cause this much dislocation and vertigo in the intimacy of one's free thinking mind, then the other figures roaming around society only stand to further degrade the moralia of the individual. One way to begin understanding the power of repression is captured in this Sappho fragment. I want to say something, but shame prevents me. Even in writing, shame is present to the speaker. The same speaker who said, quote, the one with violets in her lap, end quote, and quote, honey voiced, has more buried in here that is forbidden. The same speaker will instead say, quote, I simply want to be dead, end quote. Desire and death have always felt so similar to me. 
Even in the poems I was drawn to from the start, the speakers who were full of gravitas or hope to, or hoped to pummel their reader captured me. Class poppies in October pushed me to my own edge as the stakes for the speaker in seeing poppies bloom late in the year left me awestruck and nostalgic for something I hadn't seen myself. Oh my God, what am I? That these late mouths should cry open in a forest of frost in a dawn of cornflowers. I felt intimately implicated in the scene and tied to a ghost, the speaker who would never appear in the flesh. And I sensed that these speakers were looking inward to selfhoods tied to pain and shame and outward at a world where they weren't woven into the, that they weren't woven into the fabric of. The shame carried by the queer body and the queer collective is something I consider ethnogenetic. It may not make biological sense to an outsider since our biologies are akin to the paradox given to us in Carson's description of Sappho. For example, that a woman like me can feel inherently pulled to being pregnant and also to be sexually intimate with only women. The shame queer people experience is unique in each of our narratives. It's also rampant, historic, and unrelenting over time. To that end, the idea of goodness is a constant object of queer longing. Being cast as amoral puts a pressure on the communal queer experience, much like the pressure of Eros upon the speaker. This pressure has caused a new moralia of a resistance and a revision to arise and accumulate, especially in the trajectory of poetry. In the absence of consolations, of consolation, poems fill the void, that whole which turns out to be the central subject of love poems and all poems for what are poems, if not a kind of altruistic offering of love from the dead to the living. When one is feeling shame or amoral, they might find peace in a poem like Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. To resist, to resist the kind of bittersweet sensation that the rise of shame may impose on the body, Oliver's speaker consoles us and the self by rearranging the harmony of what's around us. Where Eros might be a limb loosener, this speaker fights all pain with anaphora. And is there a poetic technique queerer than anaphora, than repeating a word or phrase over and over with accumulation of pleasure, with the absence of consequence? Anaphora's father, Walt Whitman, used the technique to generate the ultimate lyric, the song of myself. Have you reckoned? Have you practiced? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Mary Oliver's accumulation of meanwhile here represents a peace with Eros, bitter while sweet, harsh and exciting. It all belongs at once and such sensations are part of the family of things, not anathema to it. Though new criticism has its blind spots, it's important to say that Oliver's arrival at the opening occasion for the poem comes explicitly from a queer predicament. It's hard to imagine arriving at the first three sentences without knowing that quote, being good is not possible for you if you are queer against a normative culture. Every reader puts their own despair onto the poem 
but the speaker also wants to tell you theirs, to tell you that in this life they have let, quote, the soft animal of their body love what it loves, end quote. The inverse is true as well. Death is as universal as desire. In Louise Glick's The Wild Iris, the speaker grapples with this daunting reality. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. Overhead, noises, branches of the pine shifting. Then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. It is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. Then it was over, that which you fear being, a soul and unable to speak, ending abruptly the stiff earth bending a little and what I took to be birds darting in low shrubs. You who do not remember passage from the other world, I tell you I could speak again, whatever returns from oblivion returns to find a voice. From the center of my life came a great fountain, deep blue shadows on azure seawater. This speaker is of two minds. The speaker is seeing the iris rise again. The speaker is also the iris rising again. This transmography allows the speaker to break free of Eros and become something more metaphysical. For this writer, the predicament of the opening is death itself. It has nothing to do with sexuality or gender. And yet the intersection of the reader can implicate itself on the poem as well. The poetic eye is the ultimate force of connivance. To that end, the reader is also always of two minds of the self they bring to the page and the eye they must become or put on to enter the poem. The goal is quote, full immersion as Bishop might say. But when we leave the poem, the bits that survive in us fill our own central lack. At the end of my suffering, there was a door, offers my queerness a means of consolation in dark hours. The universal predicament of death can thus be made queer by the reader. Further, to become an iris is akin to being cast as, say, Francis Flute in A Midsummer Night's Dream. You're either a man playing a woman in the play within a play, or a woman playing a man playing a woman. It's safe to say I was the latter. This dialectical and unending loop between the body and voice is what makes books and close reading live infinitely. New generations will find new things to say about all of these beloved works. And the living generation of poets presented in Queer Poem A Day this month have brought us right into these literary and queer traditions. Just as the reader becomes the eye and wild geese and the wild iris, the readers and listeners of our series must become the I in 30 poems. Just like a title or a first poem in a book gets carried through the whole reading experience, such are the poems in order as they teach the audience about the lyric self aloud and on the page. The series began with Pride Month by Shelley Wong. The poem uses anaphora as its engine, just like Oliver Whitman and many others. It is June and I read about having grace to forgive those who would condemn us. The phrase it is June comes from Anne Sexton's The Truth the Dead Know. Long turns the phrase into something utterly queer by presenting us with many different pride months, different cities, yes, but different pressures of absence as well. The father who doesn't listen, the Pulse nightclub shooting, the missing wife. Even amidst the feathers and sequins, the threat of condemnation hangs in the air. The poems also speak to each other directly, where Richie Hoffman's poem, Male Beauty, has a speaker for whom, quote, in his favorite recordings, you can hear the pianist breathing, end quote. Rachel Menes's poem, Unsent Draft, opens with a speaker looking to seduce and be seduced. Quote, last night, Naomi, I typed, music where you can hear the pianist breathing 
into my browser, end quote. When the speaker of Chen Chen's poem, Summer, describes a day full of ice cream sandwiches, floral shorteralls, and Toyota Camrys, Henri Cole's poem, Embers, begins, poor summer, it doesn't know it's dying. In Randall Mann's poem, Eros, the poetics themselves are of two minds. Eros is the name of a safe sex club. It is also a sestina. If Eros is defined by lack in this poem, the desire is solely for pleasure, for the sweet, and not the bitter. More profoundly, if Eros is necessitated by absence, this poem has an ethnogenetic ripple to absent elders, to those who may have gone to sex clubs during the AIDS crisis, for example. Therefore, following the rules of the club as mirrored in the Sestina form, stands to speak to a body politic from a complex element of queer life. The moon turned mirror in Cyril Wong's poem, The Men We Loved, talks to the many reflective surfaces in our series and in queer literature. Without public representation, queer people have had to find reflections in divergent places. For the speaker of duplicity by Jameson Fitzpatrick, it's the faces of coins. For the speaker of Want Could Kill Me by Zandria Phillips. It's the glass of a storefront window. For the speaker of Catherine Pond's riding the bus back to Oxford, it's the window out which rain falls and a field reveals itself. In Donuts by Dan Cranes, it's the barbershop mirror while the speaker gets a haircut. And in our final poem, Jenny Johnson's The Lone Palm, the interior of the self and of all selves is walled in mirrors. The reader who is sharp enough to look between the poems in that liminal space will see what we find when a mirror faces a mirror, images ad infinitum, and perhaps what those images represent, desire, love, grace, faith, eros, and so on, will go on forever too. If we carry that opening call by Wong, if we honor the idea of having grace to forgive in each of these poems, the possibility for transformation is not just within the plausible universe of an individual speaker, but in the larger arc and ripple back to the real I, the reader. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you, Lisa. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so to all of our audience here, I'm going to give you a second. If you'd like, you are welcome to share a question with us in the chat or the Q&A feature. Um, I'm also going to take a second to just show everybody the um, Queer Poem a Day website. So you can um, see what it is that we've been creating here. Um, DeerfieldLibrary.org slash Queer Poem a Day. You can find um, our introduction, Lisa and I did, and all of our 30 poets um, here. And then if you just click on one, here was today's or last poem. And you can get the little recording podcast right there, as well as the text of the poem. Um, or again, you can search for the Deerfield Public Library podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. Well, Lisa, I have a question if uh, you're open to that. Of course. Um, I am really wondering about um, your own work that we will be seeing more of later this year and how you might um, if you can, in any general way, it's kind of an unfair question, fit in um, your own work to some of the things that we were talking about tonight. Oh, I, I hope uh, readers find that it kind of fits in everywhere. Um, and of course, not that it would ever be equal to any of the texts I quoted, but that it is it, it, that my work um, learns from all of those myriad texts that I quoted. Um, 
I also think my book directly has a lot of poems that take place in Greece. So I think whatever those imagistic inheritances or dramatic inheritances might be, uh, I think content wise, it, it, I'm definitely speaking directly with Sappho at some level. I'm not sure without staring at the poems, what else I can say that's not too broad, but. <laughs> that's fine, thank you. Um, we do have one question here. I'm gonna read it to you, Lisa. Do you think queer poets often estranged historically from traditional structures of reproduction and family think differently about poetic inheritance or poetic families? I think there's a few ways to answer that. The first thing that comes to mind is our poem uh, by Eileen Miles. Their poem talks about goodness, but it also uh, lands in pure reverence, which is um, related to a family structure. I don't want to give away the end of the poem, but I definitely think going straight to Eileen Miles' poem might be my the first exit in answering that question. The other thing I will say is that I think in literary communities, you know, we often think of writers as being alone and needing that time and space away from socializing in society to create work. But I think there's a, a vast and clear history of poets who knew each other. And I think queer people create their own families out of necessity. So there's kind of a nice intersection there. If we look at, for example, the relationship between James Merrill and Elizabeth Bishop uh, and other Frank Bedard is another student turned colleague and friend of, of these communities. Um, I think that that has been a vital life source for so many poets. And I imagine and hope that people, when they see these poets who we've even presented interacting with each other, were sort of this mostly, most of the poets are of a rising generation. A lot of the poets we presented have, you know, one book, maybe less, maybe no, not many have more than four. Um, so I would say that there's kind of a camaraderie and a, a literary family building, if not a queer literary family building, that's kind of happening, whether it's um, just in letters or in our actual communities. It's part of why we also uh, presented our, for example, Chicago based writers most of them have interacted with each other or know each other or have read at readings together or all hang out at Women and Children First Bookstore. Those sorts of things I think are absolutely essential to uh, creating what others might call an informal structure, but what I think, I, I mean, my the queer people in my life are my gay family and I, I mean family with a capital F. So I would imagine and hope and think that other um, inheritances that we can see in letters and that we have now are true and clear. It's, I, I mean, I also just think it's why so many of the poets that, uh, you know, said yes to doing this, right, is that there is this um, kinship that people feel, even if that's different than, um, I don't know, that's interesting. Um, we do have one more uh, question here. This is actually from one of our participating poets. Um, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and name him because he, uh, his name is on it, um, Randall Mann. Uh, wrote, when I was, uh, when I started writing in the early 90s, I was often told to write less about sex, which was, of course, political. And I didn't listen to that nonsense. I'm gratified to see younger poets write openly and wonderfully about sex. What do you, um, what do you see the evolution of sex in queer poems over the last, say, 30 years? How do you see that evolution? Dylan, I think you also should answer this one too. I have a feeling we'll both have some interesting points of entry. The first program that we did in conjunction with Queer Poem a Day was a book club group about Elizabeth Bishop. And while we could go substantially further back, when I mean, we talked about Sappho, we could get ancient and Roman on this. Um, Bishop is such a compelling study because it's the brink in a certain way of a particular kind of poet that might have been able to be out and was not. For example, the counter part would be James Merrill, who was very open about his sexuality, and Elizabeth Bishop, who, despite having a partner, was constantly in an expatriate position, whether that was ontological or physical. 
And so I think the absence of directly talking about sex and sexuality became the poetic device of talking about sex and sexuality when we look back at Bishop's work. Um, Randall, I think the question is so great. And I think your poem is such a good model of the change that has occurred because like Bishop, who has a very famous Sestina, you have used uh, form and control to say that, that there is, I mean, it stands for so many things, but it, it's actually political to write a poem about a safe sex club that is a form poem. That tension um, is something that I think younger people are more willing to talk about existing is the tension. And I think younger artists are, I don't know if they're more able to, or if they just choose to, because we have other points of access to speaking about it. Um, our movies are less than everything in life has become less censored. I imagine that some other sharper scholar could make a connection to also the digitization of access to talking about gender, sex, and sexuality. Um, but the fact that it can be lovely and artful instead of only seen as crass, I think is even just like a broad shift. I'm sure, I, though in other circles, it is still considered crass or amoral to speak that way. I think um, the arts tend to attract people who want to progress a discourse. And I, I think we're just at this part where the discourse is luckily being progressed toward that kind of interest, transparency and vitality and artfulness in thinking about our encounters in our intimate and erotic encounters. Yeah, I, I think the other thing I would say, um, something Lisa and I have talked about in several forums around this project was um, I, I have a background in teaching, as does Lisa, and a lot of the historical poets who are, were queer, writing pretty explicitly about sex, and I think I would include Shakespeare and Walt Whitman in that, you, you can bring that up in the classroom and explicate that or not. And there's a real choice here. Um, Randall also commented that the shampoo by Bishop is one of his favorite sexual yes. poems. Yes, yes. And of course, that it's another great example. Um, so of course, I think things are getting more explicit. The other thing that comes to mind, because I've um, been rereading my first poetic love, John Ashbery, is that poem he has that's in a persona of another voice, like a straight guy voice saying, I let a guy blow me once, um, but it's so distance. It has to be like this straight guy saying that and so offhand and in um, the matrix. And then actually I think Ashbery, you see him getting more explicit, explicitly um, sexual and um, in some of the later poems. Anyway, we could talk one, more about that. One other thing I might add too, is I think that as um, all kinds of political movements occur over time in any place, um, and America is the easiest one for us to reference because that's where we are right now. Um, I think it's also just consistently harder for institutions to come to combat us the more visible we become. So if you have, for example, students with same sex parents, in a, even in a public school classroom, they're gonna ask different questions and they're gonna have different answers than some of the rote normative I'm just using even just like a broad political example. So I think also in the arts, um, Eileen Miles poem again is kind of a good response to this too, because there is a family structure now. Um, and it's one that's public and in a certain way, those things can enter the world of the poem as well as they are beginning to enter the world and enter our purview in all different kinds of communities now. Yeah, everyone go read the Eileen Miles poem. It's fantastic. <laughs> so are all the poems, but um, if there are um, any other questions, we have time for one or two more. This is just a, a wonderful question. So at least I'm gonna put this to you. Do you have any advice for a young person trying to find community around queerness and poetry? Mm. Oh boy. Uh, I have a lot of potential ideas. I mean, I think that um, 
the older I get, the more excited I am by seeing more spaces where younger people and writers are able to participate in poetry generally and, and where queer poets and young queer people are figuring themselves out, out artistically. For example, I work for an education platform called Write the World. That's a place where we have an international range of students and it's completely digital. So those sorts of things would, were never available at all because there wasn't even really an internet when I was that young, not in the way that there is now. Those are great places where you can start to find a peer group. The other thing I would say is to just, um, I think bookstores and whatever your local uh, lit mags are, if you can find them, tend to attract queer people who are just sort of looking for how to express the fringe that they feel and wear and are. Um, and if there isn't one, maybe starting one will draw those kinds of comrades to you. Um, and I will also say, I though I was very late to poetry because there weren't things like creative writing classes, I think finding creative writing classes anywhere, whether they're free, whether, I, you know, Richie Hoffman and I are both currently teaching at a, a little writing place called Ellipsis. There are people out there who are trying to do the same thing as you and just a little bit of effort uh, can go a long way. Also just find the books and let those be your peer group in the absence of finding another one. That's my best advice as a person who found Sappho alone laying on a rock miles and miles from here. Yes, go to your local library is, is one suggestion, of course. Um, and of course, online, I mean, I think one of the amazing things I've found from this project is how um, supportive and extensive the community of queer poets is online. And I think um, it's pretty easy to get into that group with uh, just being excited and talking about the poets you love. Yes, poets host weird schedules or underemployed schedules. So we tend to hang out on Twitter a lot. Find us there, we're, we're ready for you. Excellent. Well, Lisa, anything, any final uh, parting thoughts that you want to give to us? I just want to thank everyone again for their support um, for this program. It's really been a career highlight. And, and thank you, Lisa, for just really engaging me. In, uh, we've been planning this for, what, six, seven months. And um, through the, the dark time of the pandemic and, and everything going on, it's been a real joy to uh, work with these poets and poems. Um, I guess I just want to say I hope that the opening part of my talk also encourages listeners to this talk to go to those poems and keep some of those lines with you because you never know when there will be a moment that you need to be consoled by those voices. And that's just the real gift of loving poetry that I carry with me everywhere. And I know some of the lines from the series will live in me the way that those lines I mentioned by Edna St. Vincent Millay and Sappho and Plath do. I know that so many are now gonna be from the series when things are hard. And especially as COVID, you know, we're coming out of it, but it's still going on. Like I hope whenever you're taking your long walks or feeling a little bleak, maybe a line like, um, the men we love, the men we have, the men we want. It will just get stuck in your head like a song or a prayer. Beautifully said, as always, Lisa. Um, so thank you all so much. We will be posting the recording of this um, on our YouTube page so you can go back and listen to Lisa's talk. And just thank you all again for being here. Uh, thank you to the poets. I know we have a, a few poets watching. So thank you so much for your wonderful work. And um, thank you again to the Deerfield Public Library. Thank you.